Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Smuller. I am the Director of Educational Programs here with the National History Academy. And today we are going to continue our tour through different uh, historic sites across the country. And we're going to learn a bit about uh, the National Park Service National Trails today. In particular, we're going to focus on the Pony Express National Historic Trail. And today we are joined by uh, Angelica and Frank, who are going to tell us a bit more about that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Katie. So I wanted um, to introduce my colleague and myself. My name is Angelica Sanchez Clark, and I am with the uh, National Park Service National Trails Office. Uh, I am a historian with, uh, with our office. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Norris, who will be presenting uh, alongside myself, specifically on Pony Express. And Frank uh, is a recently retired historian with our office, and he used to be my supervisor. So it's really great to have him on, um, on the call. So I wanted to share a little bit about um, our office in general before we turn to um, the Pony Express specifically. So we are uh, with the National Park Service. We're with an office that we call the National Trails Office. And we actually administer nine national historic trails across the country, as well as the Route 66 Quarter Preservation Program. Um, and, you know, we like to say that the National Trails Office occupies a funny little corner of the National Park Service playground, but it's definitely one that we love and enjoy working with our partners across the country. Um, and just one second, I promised I was going to start a timer so that I don't go on for too long. Um, so uh, the nine national historic trails that we administer are uh, the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, um, the Old Spanish Trail, the Camino, El Camino Real de los Texas and El Camino Real uh, de Tierra Dentro. And our office actually did a presentation for all of you back in September on uh, El Camino Real de, de Tierra Dentro. And of course, we administer the Pony Express National Historic Trail. I think I forgot Mormon Pioneer. I think I got them all. And then I mentioned Route 66 as well. And in the chat, I'm going to put a link to our um, website so that you can go in and learn about each one of the trails. There's all kinds of awesome activities as well and videos and things like that that you can, you can read about the different trails. And I am going to attempt to share... Let me see if I can... I wanted to share our website, but I actually don't know. It says I'm screen sharing, so let me see. All right, hold on. I think I know what I did wrong. All right, hold on. It's kind of fun when you're dealing with uh, technology here. All right, are you seeing uh, our website by any chance, the National Trails Office? Uh, we are seeing it, it's kind of cut off though. Okay, all right, let me see here. I think. That's I, better. Yes. I'm more uh, familiar with Teams meetings. Well, anyway, so. Oh, can you see the whole screen here? I don't know why I can't. Uh, A little maximize. bit is cut off, but we see most of it. Okay, all right, good, good, good. Okay, so this is our, our main page and I shared the link uh, in the chat. And um, as I mentioned, we 
uh, administer nine National Historic Trails plus the Route 66. So each one of our trails has its own page. So I'm going to click on the Pony Express one. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, awesome. So uh, like I said, Frank is going to be talking specifically about um, Pony Express, but I want you to know that you can always go back and look at um, our specific uh, web page, and I'll, I'll put the link directly to this one as well in the chat. But if you go to learn about the park, you can find out uh, what kind of resources we have online. So if you're interested in learning about the history and culture of the Pony Express, or what is a national historic trail, um, or, uh, what's new or nature, and we also have interactive maps. And so those are, um, for each one of our trails, you're going to find that type of information. And so I'm going to stop sharing. All right. And then so before I forget, I do want to share another link. Um, so let me just copy and paste the link to the Pony Express, and I'll do that in our chat. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about when it comes to the trails, and because these are like really common questions that people have. So the National Historic Trails are really different from uh, trails that you might be more familiar with, such as the, the scenic trails, hiking trails, the Appalachian, the uh, Pacific Crest. And people are always, you know, writing to us and asking us, where can we hike? Where can we, you know, walk along the trails? And we've actually been really focusing on, uh, on that in the last few years of identifying portions of the National Historic Trail trails where people can actually walk and hike. But because these are historic trails, most of them are actually um, pretty much where you're gonna see modern highways, streets, uh, rail lines, things like that. Because these are trails of trade and commerce and emigration. And so a lot of these trails, a lot of these historic trails have actually evolved to become the modern highways that you might see today. Uh, but we do, depending on which national historic trail we're talking about, there are some incredible opportunities to get out there and really experience um, you know, the historic landscape similar, maybe not exactly to what it would have been like during the period of significance, but there are opportunities. And so if you go to our website, you can you can kind of seek out um, where those places might be. Now, because we are historic trails, because we administer historic trails, we don't have, we don't own or manage any of the land that the historic trails tra traverse. So it's not like a national park unit, you know, like the Grand Canyon that has these established boundaries. We're talking about trails that uh, crisscross 24 states, thousands and thousands of miles. And so in, um, in our office, we like to say on a good day when we're fully staffed, there might be 20 of us. And we are talking about administering thousands and thousands of miles. Um, our headquarters are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We also have an office in Salt Lake City and an office in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But we could not do the work that we do across the country without our partners. So we partner with Anybody, anybody who wants to work with us, we will work with them. And so most of our National Historic Trails have a volunteer partner organization. Um, and so we work with them. We provide limited funding, but really it's the volunteers out there that um, are, are either researching uh, letting us know about trail resources that should be protected, um, doing uh, organizing events 
in their communities or all along the trails. So we could, again, we could not do what we do if it wasn't for our partners. So if you're ever, ever looking for an opportunity to volunteer and maybe work with one of these uh, organizations, you can find information about them as well um, on, uh, on the website. So um, I mentioned the Route 66 Quarter Preservation Program. So that's a program um, that was funded, that was set up by Congress. Frank, is it coming up on 11 years now? that the program was established? Actually, 20 years. 20 years, all right. Yes. Yeah, and so I wanted to just mention that there's actually legislation before Congress to potentially have Route 66 designated as a national historic trail. So don't know where we are quite with that, but it would be really exciting um, to have it recognized in, in that way. So um, I think that was my brief introduction to National Historic Trails. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Frank, who's going to talk specifically about Pony Express. And Frank, if you're ready, I can go ahead and share um, our PowerPoint presentation. Please do that, Angelica. Okay. Let me get that started. Um, and go okay. on to the next slide. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go ahead and set it up as a slideshow. So just give me one second. All right, are we just looking at the cover page or is it is it showing as a slideshow? I think it is. Uh, not yet. All right, so what are you all seeing right now? We're seeing slides, but with the um, the smaller slides on the left, which is okay. All right, yeah, you know what? This has happened to us with Zoom before, um, but go ahead. I think we'll be good. And I'll just uh, I'll just go on to our next slide when you're ready, Frank. Move on to the next one, please. And okay. in fact, you can go on to the one after that as well. Okay. All right, does this work, Frank? Uh, you're still on the first screen. It looks like it's frozen, like it's trying to load. Okay, let me give it a, let me give it a chance. So, Okay, Frank, so right now I'm, I'm on our third slide. I'm only seeing the first slide now. Okay, I think it's trying to catch up. All right, do you wanna start, Frank? Sure, and okay. uh, maybe the slides will catch up. Welcome yeah, to everyone, so. and uh, I'm Frank Norris, looking forward to giving you just a snapshot about the history of the Pony Express, where it came from and why we should care about it. Um, a good starting place for the uh, trail. Excellent. I, I, I just saw the third slide here. Um, what you're looking at right there is the remains of Sutter's Mill. In January of 1848, James Marshall discovered gold um, at this mill. It was half done it was on, uh, you know, he, he was working for Mr. Sutter. He saw some gold in, in the tail race. And within a few months, the California gold rush was on. That transformed the history of the Western United States. And the following year, uh, tens of thousands of people took the long trek west to California uh, as part of the California gold rush. And by 1850, California was a state it was booming and many people from the Midwest and Eastern states 
had to move to California to seek their riches. What that brought on was an awful lot of American citizens living in California wanted to be able to communicate and to travel back and forth to the rest of the United States. But at that time, uh, conditions were very difficult for that kind of thing to get from Missouri, which was kind of the western end of the more settled part of the country, to uh, California was sometimes a three or four month travel. So in order to get around that, at least as far as the mail was concerned, Congress funded the, the what was called the Butterfield Overland Mail. Next slide, please. And you see the root of the Butterfield Mail right here. And that started in 1858, what had been for uh, mail a, or for people, a three or four month trip could now be done in just 25 days. People were talking about a transcontinental railroad, but because of the divisions in the country, because of the oncoming civil war, slave states versus free states, no action took place on that. So the Butterfield ran very successfully for two, two and a half years. But then some entrepreneurs came along and said, we can make it a, a trip between St. Louis and San Francisco even faster. And that's what brought about the, the Pony Express. Next slide, please. This is a, a map of what the United States looked like in 1860. You can see the various states in pink and the territories in gold. And, it, and, and the, the Pony Express ran across all that territorial expanse, primarily empty of non-native uh, inhabitants. Um, and it was, it was just wild country out there. So starting in April of 1860, the Pony Express got off the ground. It ran from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California. Next, please. And in fact, today you can still go to the, both of the, the terminuses of the, the Pony Express. This is the Patty House in St. Joseph, which was the eastern end of the line, right on the Missouri River, about an hour north of Kansas City. Next. And the western end of the line was the B.F. Hastings building in downtown Sacramento. It's now part of old Sacramento. It's a it's a nice historic district with a lot of older buildings in it. Next. The line between St. Joseph and Sacramento followed the green line that you see on the map here. It went through a lot of wild country. You see a number of states on that map, but none of those states existed at that time. Next. Here's a little more detailed map of the Pony Express route. And it shows that there were, between St. Joseph and Sacramento, there were 176 different stations along the way. The reason there were so many stations is a horse going at a strong trot or a, a gallop really can't uh, go for very uh, long. So every 12 to 15 miles, there was a station in which a Pony Express rider would ride that 12 or 15 miles. He would get off of a very tired horse by that time, hop onto another horse, ride another 12 or 15 miles, still carrying the same mail sack, and do that for about 75 miles. When, and at that time, the rider would pass the mochila, the, the bag containing the mail, um, over to another rider, and he would ride for another five or six stations, another 75 to 100 miles, all the way across the country in good weather and bad, at daytime, at, in day or night, in sometimes the roughest weather possible. Next. For the kind of work that they did, they looked for young single men. And this was a, a, a purported advertisement trying to attract those Pony Express riders. 
There were probably uh, 150 to 200 of them that joined the service. We don't know the names of most of them, but uh, they are American heroes because they made it through very rough country, very dangerous country, and continued on their way. Eight of them died during the 18 months that the Pony Express lasted. Next. Here's an image of, of what it was like to be out um, for a Pony Express rider. Uh, it was their job to gallop along, usually not at full speed, but at five or six miles an hour, which is faster than most people can walk, but not a, at a full gallop for a horse. And they, they would ride like that um, you know, for 12 to 15 miles to the next station until they changed horses. Uh, next. Here's a Frederick Remington painting, pretty famous painting all in all, of a rider leaving a station. And you can see what the station looks like in the background, as well as the, the clothing that the Pony Express riders use. And then the mail bags are on either side of the saddle there. Moving on. They went through very rough country. They went through mountain passes. This is a, a salt flat plain in Nevada. They, they went over high plains and, and through Nebraska. Um, it was tough country and sometimes it would get down below zero in winter or it would be up in the 80s or 90s during summertime. Next. The stations that they went to uh, depended on what the area was like. Out west, they oftentimes built their stations out of adobe. In some of the Midwestern areas, they made it, the stations out of sod, um, sometimes out of stone or, or whatever the local materials were. This is Hollenbeck, Kansas. Next. And it's one of the few stations that's still standing, by the way. Um, Cold Springs, Nevada, which is out in a pretty lonely part of central Nevada. This is what that station looks like today. I'd have to say, though, that 80% or more of the 176 stations, there's, there are no standing walls. Some of them are out in uh, ranchers' pastures or out in farmers' fields. And, and the stations didn't last very long because the materials that were used in the stations were carted off by neighboring farmers and ranchers. Next. Um, the Pony Express lost a lot of money during its time because they put so much money into building the various stations, buying the horses and the tack and that sort of thing. And by the middle of 1861, which was just a little over a year after it opened, uh, Congress had sponsored the building of a, of a transcontinental telegraph line, and many of the same messages that were being sent across the country by the Pony Express in 10 or 12 days would be able to be sent by telegraph in just a few seconds. So by November of 1861, the telegraph had been completed and the Pony Express galloped off into history it was, it was only an 18 month line. Next. But even though it was a very short term line and was not a financial success, there was a real sense of romance about the trail. And so there were a number of uh, pulp fiction books. There were a number of old movies. This is a poster for a 1925 uh, Hollywood movie about the Pony Express. And, and uh, many people are, are you know, proud to associate with the Pony Express because it was such a, an iconic period in the country's history. Next. Um, if you go out to where the Pony Express route is today, um, some parts of it are very well marked. You can see this concrete post was established by a trail association. And each of the trail stations has also been marked. So, so we know exactly where they are. We're very fortunate in that regard. Next. And, and what's very exciting is that there are a group of horse riders who every year put together what they call a re-ride of the Pony Express. This is a row of them, each holding their state flags. And they're all standing in front of the 
the Peyte House in St. Joseph, Missouri. So if you want to go ahead and be a part of that, there are a lot of people that love horses that volunteer to help carry the mail um, in a symbolic sense every year. They go westbound one year, eastbound the next, and they've been doing that for 35 or 40 years now. Next. And Frank, I'll, I'll share a link uh, through the chat in a minute for the upcoming 2022 rewrite. Okay, next. Um, and as uh, Angelica mentioned, Pony Express is at one of uh, 19 National Historic Trails. Congress passed a bill in 1992, making it a National Historic Trail. And the National Park Service administers it. In other words, we, we, we help do what we can to preserve and interpret the trail. Um, there's an awful lot of misinformation out there about the trail, by the way, because it's a, you know, an, an iconic trail. But, and this brings us to the last slide here. Next. Um, if you really want a good book that separates the fiction from the fact about the trail, this was a popular book written maybe 10 or 15 years ago by a fellow named Christopher Corbett. And it does, it, it's an excellent uh, book about the history of the trail. Thank you for listening. And I guess we'll take any questions that you might have. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Is it all right if we have a few questions? I know we're kind of at time, so I don't want to keep you uh, both. I think, I think we're good. Yeah. Okay, great. So then, uh, let me introduce uh, Ben Kellerholz. He's our intern with National History Academy, and he's going to be reading a few of the questions for you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, great presentation. And uh, let's get right to it. So how does your team manage to look over so many different trails? And do they ever work together for these programs? Yeah, so I can I can attempt to answer that. Uh, so it's really interesting because the nine national historic trails that we administer, several of them uh, either have overlapping geographic routes, themes, um, people. Uh, and so there are many times where we can work with uh, several of our partner associations or volunteers uh, together. So for example, the, the Oregon National Historic Trail and the California National Historic Trail are two separate trails. However, there's one partner association um, and that is, we, we know it by its acronym, OCTA, the Oregon California Trail Association. And um, we also, I mentioned that we have uh, an office in Salt Lake City. Well, even though it's not as clearly divided anymore as far as our responsibilities, we really do look to our Salt Lake City office um, to administer what we call the four Northern Trails. And so that would be the Oregon, the California, the Mormon Pioneer and Pony Express. And then as you head east, uh, Frank showed you that image of um, the site where the Pony Express actually starts um, at in St. Joseph. So several of our trails actually uh, either start there or cross there. So it's really interesting. We do look for ways that we can um, work with different partners, um, uh, with some of the themes and some of the sites and some of the routes that we have in common. Frank, I don't know if you wanted to add something about nope, that. I think you've said it well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great. Yes, and uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Let's see how, let's see what else we got here. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so we have a question about the uh, modern relevance of these trails and maybe what you hope people take away from these trails today if they go and experience any number of them. But um, even for the Pony Express itself, what, what can people learn today? Frank, do you want to talk specifically about relevance for Pony Express? And then I can add a couple of thoughts that I have. Yeah. Uh, to me, I think it provides us a, a moment of recognizing just how much the country 
changed so drastically in such a short period of time. Um, you know, we think of the 19th century as sort of the, the century of manifest destiny, which is kind of a loaded term, sort of an Anglo-oriented kind of term, but, but it was one in which Americans who up until about 1850 were primarily an East Coast and perhaps Midwest country, and they began to set their sights on, on the West and wanted to um, incorporate it into the, into the rest of the, of the US. And of course, a lot of the study that, that both historians in general and our office is concerned with is, is we recognize the impacts that this took place, place to Native Americans. We try to recognize the importance of African Americans and of Hispanic folks who have played a, a role in the trail. It, it, it was obviously not, it, it was a two-way street and a fairly complex kind of story. Angelica, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what I was gonna say is, um, and our office is really committed, and I'm really proud of this, of, of telling diverse um, stories on the trail and uh, engaging with partners to really tell a more complete story of what are often pretty difficult and, and complex histories. So it's something that we do by uh, engaging with um, tribal members and um, African-American societies and universities and um, with uh, Latino organizations across the country. Um, and so it's it's something that we've been doing for years and years and and that we will continue to focus on because the the history of these trails um, it's a history of of what today we call the United States and so I think that people will find a connection one way or another with the stories that we try to tell about the about these trails. That's wonderful. As a follow up with your um, combined years of experience in these fields, do you find uh, growing or established pushback to those ideas that you're um, espousing because we all would like a more diverse history. And uh, I know in my college spaces that these things are talked about, but there's also cultural pushback and we mm -hmm. see across the country history right now is probably more politicized than it ever has mm -hmm. been. So what has that change been like for, for you folks? And what are those interactions like with, with people when you're trying to share these diverse histories? I can share a personal anecdote. Um, I worked with the trails office for more than 10 years. And when I would first go to association meetings, I would have to say that not only were the membership of these association um, associations primarily white and male, um, but they usually didn't pay much of much attention to diverse peoples along the trail. And I'm very proud to say that on their own volition, perhaps with a little prodding every now and then, mm -hmm. in recent association meetings, we've had uh, Pawnee fellas and Kiowa fellas um, come and talk about their role with the trail. Uh, we've had listening sessions with probably 30 or 40 different tribal leaders in, in which they talk about, sometimes angrily, sometimes more philosophically, about how the trails have impacted their lives. Because in many ways, it, it, you know, it, it had severe impacts on them. Mm -hmm. Angelica, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, thank you, Frank. That's exactly right. Um, you know, we, I, the partner associations that you know that I've worked with, um, as Frank mentioned, they're, they they tend to be white, male, and older because they're usually retired people that can dedicate time because they're volunteers. But I think that they have been very responsive to the goals of the National Park Service when it comes to relevance, diversity, and inclusion. So um, we, you know, we participate in their strategic planning meetings. Uh, we attend their board meetings and things like that. And it's something that I see that they are working towards and not just, not just, you know, 
telling us that, but actually in their in their uh, strategic plans, in their uh, goals for you know, the current year, you know, short term and long term. So it's been really gratifying to see that. And, um, you know, another we we struggle in the National Trails Office to engage younger people, uh, like I said, because a lot of our our partners are usually older and retired. But we work really closely with lots and lots of universities and uh, internship uh, programs across the country. We're always looking for ways that we can bring on interns and volunteers and and things like that. And so that's like one of my favorite things that that we do. I'm sitting right now in our office at the University of New Mexico campus, and I absolutely love working with the students here. But anyway, that's another way that we engage with with a different audience. And it's just amazing how much we learn from from them. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I'm joining our call from the University of Arizona, where our history department building is now named after Cesar Chavez. So these things these interactions yeah. are, are increasing and it is always fun to see. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we don't wanna take up all of your day. So perhaps we'll move to this um, concluding question for the both of you, which is what advice you might have for future historians, for people who wanna do work like this and um, yeah, any advice you might have? Frank, um, do you- <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> what I- what I would be the, the first to add is that there are, um, I, I had a very successful career with the Park Service, I, I, or should I say enjoyable. And I'm glad to say that of the 420 units of the National Park Service, I would say easily half of them concentrate on one aspect or more of, uh, of US history. And I'm very glad to say that when the Park Service, you know, was a much younger organization. An awful lot of those units were Civil War and Revolutionary battlefields. But uh, there, there have been a lot of diversity into African American inventors, into Japanese American in, in um, concentration camps, basically internment camps during World War II of Rosie the Riveter up in the Bay Area and and women's roles. There's a Cesar Chavez National Historic Site. So there's a a huge diversity of those areas. And and, um, there are some possibilities with uh, trails as well. Angelica? Yeah, definitely. I, I, it's really, to me, it's really fascinating that when you talk to those of us that are classified as historians within the National Park Service, we actually come from uh, varied academic backgrounds. So Frank, for example, has his doctorate in geography. I actually have my doctorate in um, literary and cultural studies in the Spanish from the Spanish and Portuguese department, but with a concentration in history. Um, so you, it, it really is uh, about your love and your passion and your interest and definitely not to give up. But I will say that something that, that even I feel like I lack, and I see that in our younger uh, employees, we just hired, well, I shouldn't say just two years ago, a PhD graduate from the Department of History here at UNM. And I would definitely encourage you to look into any kind of public history programs um, and also to brush up on your technical skills, GIS, digital humanities, I mean, that is, that's really where I personally right now am relying on our, on our younger uh, colleagues because they bring that with them. And it's a real plus for people in humanities to have um, that background. And I would hasten to add that of all those different units that I mentioned in the service, what the way you get into the service is by spending time at a visitor center desk leading tours, Mm -hmm. um, uh, being at an entrance station and, and, you know, taking payment from people driving it, very general things. And as with so many 
agencies, companies and such, you kind of start out on the ground floor with a relatively modest salary, perhaps working as a seasonal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you don't even need a bachelor's degree for many of these beginning. You, you might want to work in maintenance. There are some excellent jobs there. But after a while, you might seek out an area that has some special interest to you. And as you work your way up, you're able to apply your trade in a historical area, um, you know, it, it, as you work with other staffers at those units. Mm -hmm. And and Katie, I'd be happy to share later um, some links uh, with you about internship opportunities within the Park Service, and then you can share that out with your group. You might already have all of that information. No, that would be great. And we can even go back afterwards and add them on um, to the comments in this video. Great. If anyone wants to check back later, we'll um, be sure to get those added. Great. Great advice. Angelica and Frank, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we love learning about the National Trails, the work you do. And uh, I can at least personally say I learned a lot from you guys today. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you for inviting us, Katie. And thank you, Ben. And Frank, thank you. I enjoyed <laughs> taking part. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone at home, thank you again for joining in. And we'll be back here next week and we'll return to our original time of 4 p.m. Eastern. And we hope to see you there and have a wonderful rest of your day.